I think right now the United States is, you know, if we're, th I think there are two important triangles in Northeast Asia. Uh, one of them is U.S., Japan, uh, South Korea. And this is really a triangle of hedging, if you want, against China or against North Korea. But then there's a second triangle, which is China, the U.S., uh, China, South Korea, and uh, Japan. And that's very much more the engagement triangle. And unfortunately, that second triangle is really suffering from broken legs now with Abe and, uh, and the difficulties that his revisionism has created for South Korea and China. But, you know, if, I mean, on the security triangle, I think it was very disappointing to the United States to have the whole legacy of the Obama administration undercut by Abe's continual revisionist history, the visits to Yasukuni, the NHK spokespeople who were uh, talking about the, the fact that there was never a, you know, a massacre in Nanjing, et cetera. So blatant, ridiculous historical revisionism, and certainly the United States wants to distance itself from that, but more importantly, it would like Abe just to keep his mouth shut, uh, because that has nothing to do with America's longer-term efforts at convincing China that it needs to be cooperative in many areas and convincing South Korea and Japan that they have reasons to cooperate militarily. Every time Abe opens his mouth on some nationalist issue, it reinforces worries in South Korea and reinforces worries in China, and it makes it difficult to keep that China, South Korea, Japan triangle of engagement intact. So as you know, the trilateral leaders meeting that was a spin-off from the ASEAN plus three had made some real progress since 2008. And, you know, there was a common investment treaty that was agreed to among the three countries. There were negotiations on a, a free trade agreement or a trilateral free trade agreement. Those are all, the, the trilateral free trade is now stalled. There's been no meeting of the leaders. And that, I think, is just very bad for the overall policy of engagement. Whereas the policies of containment the triangle of containment, if you want, South Korea, Japan, the U.S., is strong and being reinforced uh, at one level, but it's also being handicapped by Japanese behavior because it makes it difficult for South Korea to cooperate with Japan. So right now, I think the United States and the Obama administration is very frustrated with Abe, very frustrated with the direction that he's taking because it runs counter to America's notions of containment uh, and engagement at the same time. It seems to be all about Abe and containment and nationalism and identity politics with no efforts at engagement with the neighbors. Let's uh, talk uh, a little bit more of, of, uh, of Japan. Um, I mean, in East Asia, there's been a um, so-called Japan problem um, until very recently uh, it was concerned with a Japan um, militarily and an economically uh, powerful country um, that is declining, um, inactive, and sometimes immobile, uh, stricken by domestic political problems. Um, that Japan sort of you know, disappeared these days, and, and you know, all of a sudden with Abe Shinzo in power, we see more aggressive uh, uh, proactive Japan, both in security and, and the economy. Um, you just, you know, mentioned uh, um, Prime Minister Abe's uh, security policies. Can you add more on that? And then also, mm -hmm. uh, what would be um, sort of the new Japan impact of new Japan on um, you know regional security environment mm -hmm. and also regional economic environment? Right, uh, because Abe was very active in, in, you know, promoting TPP, although, you know, you don't really make much progress in, in mm -hmm. using, um, you know, dialogue between the uh, United States and Japan. Right. right. I'd start by saying that I think Japan made, Japan, when it focused on economic development, played a very positive role across the Asian region. And I mean that for several dimensions. 
first of all, the economic success of Japan, I think, much as it's unpopular to say it in Korea, I think that was also picked up by um, uh, General Park for South Korea to emulate many of the strategies of Japan. It was picked up by the KMT, Chiang uh, Kai-shek in Taiwan. And in some ways, it moved both South Korea and Taiwan from an excessively military focus, which both governments had in the 70s and into the early 80s, to a much greater appreciation of the power of economic development and eventually laid the groundwork for them both to become functioning, thriving democracies. And I think Japan also played a positive economic role in the development of Southeast Asia. A lot of Japanese investment going into that area, that catalyzed an awful lot of uh, the economic success of Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, mm -hmm. etc. So, so I think a rich and prosperous and economically concentrated Japan is an incredible plus for the region. And I, I should add, Japan, much as the Chinese would hate to admit it, played a very positive role in China's economic development. A lot of Japanese aid went to China. Japan was the first country to back off from sanctions after Tiananmen. It's been relatively quiet about human rights violations in China. So Japan has not been a bad partner for China as well. So a rich and thriving and economically successful and dynamic Japan, I think, is a great benefit to the region. Uh, that said, uh, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a mistake to concentrate too much on Japan's recent military moves. I think Japan has perfectly good reasons for reinterpreting the Constitution and taking on a larger military and defense role. Uh, its military budget is still relatively small for a country of its size. Its military activities have generally been extremely cautious, you know, supporting the Afghanistan war from offshore with fueling vessels, uh, sending a small contingent to Iraq, but it's, it's really been minimally involved in any conflicts. And, you know, its big help has been with the Coast Guard to many Southeast Asian countries dealing with piracy issues and so forth. So, so I think we have to be careful not to assume that because Japan is increasing its military budget slightly or talking about collective self-defense that somehow we're back to the 1930s. Now, having said that, the last point I would make is that Abe does not make that interpretation easy because Abe, with his reinterpretation of history, with his blinders on with regard to Japan's behavior in the 1930s, with his presumed insistence on revising the Constitution, uh, with his strange attitudes toward um, religious education and uh, uh, the role of women and, and so forth, uh, it's very easy to come to the conclusion that he is the reincarnation of his grandfather, uh, Kishi Nobusuke, in the pre-war period. Uh, and so unfortunately, I think Abe, I think Japan has a relatively safe message in many ways in its economic recovery effort and its slight increases in military. Mm -hmm. But Abe is the wrong messenger because he comes with the message that makes it very easy for anyone critical of Japan to see the absolutely worst mm -hmm. face of the country. And that has a second downside. The, the constant rhetoric on defense and security and uh, history and the visits to Yasukuni Shrine and riding in planes that are labeled 731 uh, and all of those things that have symbolic, um, uh, that, are, that are symbolic fireboxes in Asia um, run the risk of taking Japan's attention away from economic recovery. Right now, Japan has a huge debt. It's had long 20 years of, of depression and debt and um, uh, de um, demoralization on the part of its public. And it becomes very critical for Japan to get its economy going, for Japan, but it's also very critical for the rest of the region. So if I had my druthers, I'd rather see Abe forget about all of the 
foreign policy foci that he's got with all of the history issues and so forth, concentrate on improving the economy, be willing to make those structural reforms, and a, a stronger Japanese economy would, I think, enable him to have much closer relations with South Korea, uh, would take away the notion of a threat to China, and would position Japan well with regard to Southeast Asia. So I think he's you know, a dangerous messenger at this point uh, because he may take his eye off the economic reform because of his concerns about uh, correcting what he sees as all the mistakes of history. Do you um, sort of you know, predict that uh, Prime Minister Abe um, you know, keep uh, taking the current um, posture of, of you know, um, making a history uh, revisionism, um, militarization, um, and of course, you know, uh, he uh, keep you know pursuing economics. Um, but um, you know, obviously, uh, those you know foreign policies uh, will go against uh, the interest of the United States and Korea. Um, do you see uh, any possibility um, that Abe would be more pragmatic enough mm -hmm. to change his foreign policy stance and sort of, you know, making um, trilateral cooperation uh, happen, uh, things like that? It's hard to be optimistic about it mm -hmm. uh, because I've talked to people who know Abe, and he really seems to believe all of these historical issues that he articulates. So it's not as though he's doing this with a false belief that somehow it's going to make him popular. It's something that he really believes in his gut, as they say. And so advisors tell him to you know, play this down, be quieter on this, etc but he seems not to listen. Uh, the United States sent numerous missives out to suggest that he should not focus on these issues, he should stay away from Yasukuni Shrine, and he just went ahead and did it. Uh, so he's clearly a man who thinks he can do these things and get away with it, uh, in part because he thinks he's correct, in part because I think he feels that there's no counterbalancing force uh, against him. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is the biggest worry with regard to Northeast Asia right now. Um, even though the United States and Japan are close allies, even though Japan's a democracy, um, I, I worry that Abe is going to not move the economy sufficiently quickly. Right now, the last quarter, the uh, GDP was only up 0.7%. Uh, it it's looks like growth is slowing. It looks like the stock index has fallen back to uh, normal levels. So the initial spurt of enthusiasm has, I think, been waning. And I think it's really going to get a shot in the arm if and only if Abe really makes some dramatic moves on structural reform. And I would say TPP would be a plus in that regard. It works in the same direction. But I think somehow, uh, he has been putting a lot more attention on the issues of history, national identity, reinterpretations, etc. Uh, and I think that's just a misuse of political resources. You said that, that you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe is a problem. Uh, when you see, uh, the, you know, the Korea-Japan relationship uh, these days, it's, I think, uh, all-time law. Mm. And, um, how do you view um, South Korea's, you know, policy toward Japan right. and toward sort of, you know, history issues? Yeah. Um, I'm talking about, you know, President, President Park's yeah, right. policy. Right. I think, I think President Park has been very good in articulating policies that would suggest the importance of building trust among neighbors in the direction of trying to focus on non-traditional security issues where they can cooperate. Um, I think all of these things are a plus. Personally, I wish that she would have a bit more of the courage of someone like Kim Dae-jung, who was prepared to meet with Prime Minister Obuchi 
and essentially say we have a very negative history bilaterally, but it's really important for us to put that behind us and look for ways that we can cooperate in the future. Mm -hmm. But Obuchi is very different from Abe, uh, and Kim is different from Pak, so I may be asking for too much. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me there are extremely good reasons for Korea and Japan to cooperate, both democracies, both allies of the U.S., both uh, very positive dynamic economies. They both have close interactions with each other that uh, would involve cooperation on a host of issues. They both could play a very positive role in terms of improving the environment in China, um, environmental pollution in China. So in many of these ways, there's, you know, there are good structural incentives for the two of them to cooperate. But those, the legacy of the history issue, particularly as it's interpreted by the leaders in both countries, have really made for a very poisonous politics, I think, lately. Mm -hmm. um, um, I did have the good fortune to meet with uh, President Park last uh, December, and she was very strict on her uh, comments that, you know, if Japan-Korea relations are going to improve, Japan has to take the initiative. And so far, Japan has not, I think, taken much of the initiative on this. And the Yasukuni visit came maybe two weeks after I saw her. I can't imagine what she was thinking, but that clearly was not a direction of des direction designed to improve relations. You just uh, touched upon um, the issues of, of regional cooperation and the non-traditional issue areas. Mm. Uh, the South Korean um, government uh, now uh, proposed a so-called Northeast Asia Peace uh, and Cooperation Initiative. Uh, that is a regional version of, of trust politic. Um, right. And um, you know, you you want to cooperate in the non-traditional security areas or soft security, soft areas and the build up trust and build up the habits of cooperation uh, and then you expect spillover effects toward uh, the hard security areas. Right. Um, this is an initiative and this is a proposal from the Korean government. How uh, do you see it? How do you evaluate mm. uh, this initiative? I think it's probably very good in the abstract. I think certainly building habits of cooperations across national borders is a plus. I think uh, there certainly is an absence of trust among many of the top leaders across Northeast Asia. At the same time, I think that one has to be careful about assuming that because three countries can cooperate on cleaning up the environment, that that will somehow resolve the territorial issues that they have between them, or that somehow it will resolve history, history issues or identity issues. Um, there's always that hope that cooperation in areas A, B, and C spill over to D, E, and F, but oftentimes government policies are in silos and the environmental technicians can cooperate without any generals being involved or without the foreign ministry being involved or without that affecting ODA. So, uh, so I, would, I would use this to say that one of the big disappointments that I think I would see in East Asian regionalism is the fact that the trilateral leaders meeting is not being held. It's been on hold essentially since Abe came into office. And I think if you want to build trust across different issues, having the senior leaders of those countries involved goes a long way in that direction. Because in preparation for those meetings, the staff of the presidents or the prime minister have to put together think pieces. What are we going to cooperate on? How do we get some talking points, et cetera? And suddenly you begin contacting multiple agencies and saying, OK, you guys seem to have cooperated on pollution with these other countries. Tell us more about that. Is this something that our president can use to help uh, create a climate of trust? So I think the potential is there, but it gets, if it's only operating at the director general level or the, um, at the level of individual bureaucratic agencies, it doesn't have the same potential for spillover 
as it does when you get the top leaders involved, because then you mobilize the entire government. And so I would like to see a resumption of the trilateral meetings, even though that would probably be extremely difficult for President Park for domestic reasons, and it would be extremely difficult for Xi Jinping. But I would think that would be a very positive direction to move in mm -hmm. if, in effect, those two leaders could say, look, we find ourselves in fundamental disagreement with Abe's view of history, but we also feel that there are good reasons to look for areas of cooperation with Japan that transcend the history issues. We think it would be good to have a meeting. And if they could get those meetings back on track, the possibility is there to move, for example, the trilateral FTA forward. I think that would be a big plus, and I think getting those three leaders in the same room mm -hmm. would be a, um, a very positive move. It's not going to be easy domestically. Uh, mm -hmm. I just saw a poll from uh, one of your agencies that show that Abe is now less popular than Kim Jong-un. So you've got to be You've got to be pretty, pretty unpopular to um, outdo Kim Jong Un. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be a it's going to be a difficult sell for President Park. But I think she has, I think she has the capacity as a leader to do this, and it might be a very positive legacy for her. Thank you, TJ. Uh, uh, time is up. Uh, okay. It's been a very interesting and very enlightening discussion. Um, but uh, do, you, do you have uh, any more to say? No, if I start uh, talking about Russia, then we'll, we'll be here for another hour and a half. But uh, no, I think that was, uh, that's, probably, that's probably covered most of